Hello and welcome. My name is Derek. And when you search for Bitcoin on TradingView, you will find multiple exchanges. Same thing with BitcoinCharts.com as well. The Mt. Gox information is available. MTGOX. This was the origin for Bitcoin trading. They started in 2010 when Bitcoin was six cents. And then moving on for over three years before they were finally done. And they were done at a price of $135 on the 25th of February. With the monstrous red candle down moves. I can scroll and get more data and see that this thing, it really got going. As again, this was the six cents point in summer of 2010. And then it just went up and up. And we'll take a look at some of the historical data in a little bit. But here's what's interesting about this particular chart. If we look at the price action, we can see that it left the 18 average of lows on February the 6th. It did so at the price of $900 because we can see on the top O, which was open 904.7. The high was that same price and the low was down to 800, but it left it at 900. And obviously the low was set in at $91 on February the 21st. This was, I got another exchange available, Bitstamp. It's the only exchange I use to look at long-term data. But as stated before, or as, I don't know if I stated this or not, but the big volume was on the Mt. Gox, the vast, vast majority. Well over 70, 80%, I think. I don't know what the number was. It might've been over 90%. It was large, at least at one point. On Bitstamp, January, uh, Let's just, we'll take a look at these numbers later, but February 25th, Bitstamp had, well, these should be reversed. It had a high of 545 and a low of 400. It closed pretty much where it opened at 540 area. So it would way down, losing 30% and then getting it all back. And this was on its final day where this high was 173 and its low was 101. That's a major discrepancy that ultimately tells me that the wallets were closed. You could not transfer Bitcoin at that time. For if you could, you would obviously have sent it to Bitstab any other places it might have been available to send to, and of course, any hardware wallets. But if that was available, people would have done that. However, people were selling because what other choices did they have at the time? And again, I know there's a lot of things where, the, where I think players' funds were frozen and they've just recently, are because of the sell-off in early this year, that they're paying people the equivalency of what their US dollars were worth back then. And I'm, I'm sure they're saying, yeah, when it was worth 135, I don't know how they're doing it, but this was a, a panic situation because the exchange in which they were dealing with was having the problems within. On February 14th on Bitstamp, there was a beautiful update where the high was 713 and the low was 538 on February 14th. This was a down day here on February 14th and the price was like 500 and a 300 differential. On February 10th, it was the exact same numbers pretty much on Bitstamp, which is what I found interesting, but 713 there and on here it was a high of 700 and a low of 500. So that's where the numbers were pretty much around the same. I'm still wondering if the Bitcoin wallets would have been offline then because these were interesting numbers as well. 
because on January 27th, and I'll show this chart at the end of this video if I can remember, and I probably will. But the January 27th low was $725. On here, the January 27th data has a low of 937. This was a case where Bitstamp was off by a very significant portion. So there must have been wallets offline again, either from Bitstamp or maybe from both that and as well as Mt. Gox. There could have been no other way. Bitcoin prices are always going to stay within each other on every exchange. And if you're wondering for the reason why, it's because the art of the arbitrage traders will always manage to make sure the numbers find a fair value amongst each other, amongst a reasonable percentage differential. And the major changes or the major moves are always short term. Unless, of course, situations like this happens and you can't do anything to arbitrage because the wallets are offline. January 6th, Bitstamp got to $1,000. January 6, this one 1100, maybe showing the earlier signs of the wallets having a little bit of problems. But for what it's worth, let's take a look at this and go back in time. Because every single time Bitcoin has crashed, it has managed to uh, recover. So, what we'll do is we'll take a look at every single Bitcoin crash going back to 2010 and then after we're done this we'll move over to bitstamp so i'm going to scroll this over and take a look at less days so there we have it so all this early i don't care about this too much low volume volatility you get these codes with the ones you find on the bottom of the volume list that move like this today and people talk about how bitcoin's not a stable currency you don't start off stable. You work to grow towards it. And it's been growing well towards it in time so far. So as we move on, price action has tremendous gains early on. Here's a spot where you go from 50 cents. It was 6. So to go from 6 cents to 50 was magnificent. But 50 cents up to $30. Bitcoin's a serious topic amongst uh, more people. It's still, of course not talked about now this might not look like a crash but when you're going from over 30 to five dollars and change th th i mean this is why for me as an analyst as a trader i look at something down a lot or up a lot always in comparison and the people will go out in bitcoin talk about oh it's down 60 percent 65 percent and they're like Okay, well, what does that number mean? Up or large or small, hot and cold, is only such when you can compare it with something else. And when you can compare it with a gain of going from 50 cents to here, you can see this is just a okay size move down, going from 30 and over 30 to under 6 or about 6. 5x down and that was a small move and it even went down further it went down to two and the two move was still productive on a bullish case you could have said yeah i could go down to a buck even but going from 30 down to two that didn't kill bitcoin obviously and then the price action rose higher. Now we're seeing, we were seeing 2030. Now this thing goes to 260 and it immediately would trace back down to 50. And 80% down is small here because we're in comparison to moving up from $9 to here. Log scale functions are amazing. Moving on. And then we're moving on to, of course, the last crash so we're gonna to have to move it to this point on using that of bit step 
And when you click on here, this is where you can find all of the exchanges. So we got Bitfinex, we got Coinbase, there's the Bitstamp, but just looking at furthers, we got CEX, HitBTC, Gemini, WEX, OKCoin, OK IT, Mt. Gox, that's what I was showing you, BTCE, that's got historical data going back as well, Huobi, and then just so many others. So we'll go to Bitstamp, and this is where we currently are at 8,000. So I'm going to just scroll back, use my mouse to bring it back as far as I can. You might need advanced features to go back this far on a daily time frame, which I have. I have this the lowest pre account that you pay for on this one. I don't need anything more, but I do like its extra features that it has. Okay, so we're going back to this uh, time frame here, because as I mentioned to you before, within those key levels, it was in the date of February 25th when Mt. Gox was kaput. And February 25th would represent this day right here, which I showed that mentioned the cat tail formation matching this previous low. So within this move, Bitcoin going from 1100 years later would go down to 252 or no under that 200 150 even so we've had 1150 that's about a 9x loss and because each one is getting lower as price stabilizes better through time I already know what happens after this. Every type of move that happens is going from like 315 down to 200. That's not losing half its value. 500 down to 300. Again, not losing half its value. 775 down to 4. Bitcoin never did ever lose half its value until its most recent correction. So all of the moves that it has had amongst this time frame has always been a short-term move. And when we look at things within well, the weekly time frame, I think would work out well for this because this is the only time this has went down. But the move lower from 20,000 to 6,000 is that of only three times going from like eight well that would be like that's why i call it a half ass move long term for a correction but that's that might all that's all it may need if it goes down to three thousand we would be talking about going from 20 divided by three which is seven see i would be very concerned if price action is that like 2450, 2370? I will no way be concerned if I see price action at 4126 or 3615 or three, th or even if I see a 26, I'm going to realize that, okay, it's going to pierce extra below. It should start to rally. But if I see that it's not and this level's going to go lower, because if last time it had an 8x correctionary move down, I still realize 20 divided by the 3 is about a 7. But I also realize that if it has a very large correction compared to its previous ones, but not so much compared to its previous large ones, and the price action breaks up higher, 15,000 over 20, 30, 50, so on and so forth, that it's going to have a very large decent correction losing maybe 4x its value at some point later on 5x anything like that matter there because when you go up like this you know you're going to have a good fall at some point and it's okay that's one way of looking at it and yes yeah, so thank you for tuning in to this video. 
Uh, good luck with all your trading investment decisions, of course. No matter whose information you look at and all that type of stuff, or whether you pay for the information or not, everything you've always done within your investing is always within your own decisions. You are in control of your money, especially within the Bitcoin system. And therefore, when you're in control, the risks are going to be associated. But when risks are associated, so are rewards as well. For you've heard people have probably complained about the stuff. Oh, man, I took this person's advice and I lost 50 grand. Yet they don't talk much about, oh, I took this person's advice and I made like, I don't know, a whole whack load of coin, like 300 grand or whatever. And even on, I've lost 500 bucks, depending on how small or big of a player you are. Now, interestingly, as a, I'm going to just quickly go off and talk about NBA and golf and sports betting because I have a futures bet right now on the Philadelphia 76ers to go to the NBA finals, win the Eastern Conference. And I got such close to 40 to 1 odds. I did so on uh, a little over two months ago. They lost yesterday, unfortunately. The series is tied at one. But I've only once ever hit a big score of anywhere near or greater than that number. And the one I hit was well greater than that number. It was well over 100 to 1. I think about three years ago, two years ago even. Maybe yeah, it would have been two years ago. The Masters golf tournament was on. And it was the... One in the summer, I think it was like the June, July one, the U.S. Open. It was like the big one. I think it was the U.S. Open. Yeah, it was the U.S. Open from two summers ago. And I was watching Fantasy Sports Network on YouTube with Pat Mayo as and another major golf advocate. I can I know what his face would look like and what his voice would look like. It's been years since I've watched him, probably around that time. And they mentioned, yeah, this golfer, I got it over 100 to 1 to win it, and I, it's only going to go lower, and I made a bet on it. I can't remember what his name was. Literally, I cannot remember. I've been thinking about this for two or three days. I refuse to search because I want to see how long it takes, and I'm probably gonna, I give up. I'm going to see in the comment section probably now. Well, the odds of this golfer throughout the days and weeks was going lower, 80 to 1, 70 to 1. I think it closed at like even 50 or 60 to 1. I was really happy the fact, well, hey, you know what? No matter what happens, they were right. I had a good long-term pick. And as day one and day two went on, I was in it. Day three, and then, see, I guess I got a chance. Not a good one, but I got a chance. And then I'm watching the television set on that day, the day four, final day. And I realized just by looking on this, on watching whatever other game, a basketball, some baseball game probably in the summer, that I seen on the bottom on the ticker that they showed the golf leaders. And my golfer was in the lead on like hole 16 or hole 17. I was like, what the heck is going on? Like, well, Jordan Spieth, who was the favorite in the leader, he had a horrible hole, like hole 9 or 10, where he like triple or quad bogeyed or something. It was... Just a bad, bad spot for him. But that one play, that one hole, won me a decent amount of coin. Especially when I made a big, big bet earlier that lost. And I got it back and then some on that one, which was really, really nice. And I can't remember what that golfer's name was. But I took the risk reward on that information. In that case, it paid off. And being in control of your own decisions being in control of the risk reward, understanding allocation amounts and things like that, how much to buy, how much to sell, how much, what percentage to do this, I think is very, very important as an investor and a trader. Thank you for tuning in and have yourself a great day. Bye-bye.